In this video, we're going to talk about a new type of unit conversion unique to chemistry. Using the unit of moles to link together a quantity of chemicals that we can measure in the lab to a number of molecules or atoms that relates back to what happens uh, when we do calculations. We'll start with a quick review of what's going to be happening in this video. Uh, first, we'll start with a description of uh, what is a mole actually. Uh, we'll talk about some details there. Uh, doing these conversions requires dimensional analysis, so we'll take a brief uh, moment in time just to review what dimensional analysis is and how it factors in. We'll then talk about the concept of a molecular weight versus molar mass. Again, words that are commonly used interchangeably, but in actuality have slightly different meanings. All of these conversions and all the mathematics is going to get summarized at the end, and what we'll talk about is a flowchart. Uh, you'll have the opportunity to print that flowchart out on your own. And last but not least, we'll end up with um, a couple practice problems just to get your feet wet in terms of these. Clearly, we'll be doing more of these conversions in class, as this is eventually going to be becoming one of the most fundamental types of calculations we do uh, pretty much from now until the end of the year. So let's start with what a mole actually is. And this unit was created uh, through a need... This is a good idea here. A need to link together the work that we do in the lab uh, and the mathematics that we're actually going to do on paper so we can connect those two things together. To clarify, uh, in the lab, we measure things, and we measure them typically in terms of masses or volumes that we're going to be dealing with. Uh, however, on paper, uh, when we're dealing with things, we're usually keeping track of numbers of actual atoms, and we do this in the form of a balanced chemical reaction. Those balanced coefficients are telling us numbers of molecules that are reacting with numbers of other molecules. As a result, there's a disconnect between the two of these things that we need to address here. Uh, and that's exactly what this mole conversion is about. It's a conversion factor that links these two worlds together. The stuff we measure in the lab and the calculations and mathematics that we do on paper. So what a mole really is, then, is a way to keep track of a number of molecules or atoms. Um, it's a quantity of things. Just like a dozen equals 12, a mole equals a certain number of things as well. And that certain number has to be very, very large because atoms themselves are very, very small. We want to make sure that the number we're keeping track of is big enough that we'll actually be able to detect it on a balance or scale itself. Uh, and that brings us to the value itself. Uh, the number that we use is a number called 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. Uh, if you're seeing this times 10 to the 23rd number, you're recognizing that that's very large. Here it is written in regular notation. And again, we have yet another reminder why we like scientific notation so much. It also starts to give you a perspective on how big uh, or how small an atom must be if this number is required to be so big. Now, the number itself is not a random number. Uh, it's a number that was determined via scientific methods, uh, and it's referred to as Avogadro's number based on the scientists who came up with this. Uh, a sad story of a scientist who came up. This number didn't receive a lot of recognition until after he had died, and scientists started to really appreciate the value of what's going on here. But anyway, what the point of the number is, and we'll talk about why it's this particular number in a second, is it links together the mass of a sample to how many atoms or molecules are in that sample as well. And that's exactly what we said we needed a minute ago, was something that connected the mass that we measure in class to the number of molecules or number of particles that we would actually use in our calculations. Now to end our conversation defining what a mole actually is, uh, I'd like to address the fact that it's kind of a very specific number. And I would say it's a very specific number for a very good reason. It's chosen for a specific reason. Uh, and that specific reason can be shown uh, by setting up a little bit of a table. Take a second, copy table down next like this one, uh, and then we can talk about why this number is so valuable. So to start, let's take example of one of the elements from our periodic table, the element hydrogen. Uh, if you look on your periodic table, we can determine the mass of one hydrogen atom by looking up its atomic mass or atomic weight. Uh, and that's going to be 1.00794 atomic mass units. Now, an atomic mass unit is the mass uh, that goes along with uh, protons and neutrons. Uh, it's very convenient when you're talking about individual atoms, but it is not convenient when dealing with things in the lab. In the lab, we measure things in terms of grams. Here's the beauty of the number 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. It has a built-in conversion factor that converts us from atomic mass units ultimately into grams. When you have 6.022, so that's 6.022, 
0.022 times 10 to the 23rd of these hydrogen atoms over here, the mass of all those atoms combined ends up being 1.00794 grams. The number stays the same and only the unit changes. So instead of having to do a conversion factor for each individual calculation from atomic mass units to grams, we instead choose a very specific number that does that conversion for us. And all we can do is copy down the number. Works for other elements as well. Carbon, 12.011 atomic mass units on the periodic table, which means that a mole of those carbon atoms weighs 12.011 grams. Uh, and then we'll take another one, chlorine. 35.453 atomic mass units on your periodic table means a mole of chlorine atoms is 35.453 grams. In short, the mass on your periodic table is basically equal to the molar mass of your element. We substitute the unit AMUs, which we can now get rid of, and we write instead the unit of grams, which is a much more practical unit for doing calculations and math in class. Okay, so that is a great way to talk about the masses of individual atoms. We also need to be able to talk about the masses of entire compounds, substances that are made up of many atoms at once. Uh, and we've already talked about that in the year in terms of things like molecular weights and molecular masses. And these were the total masses of the compound, individual molecules, and they were calculated by adding the masses of the individual atoms together. So for example, if you have the compound H2O, we can take 2 times the mass of hydrogen, 1.0, 0794 plus 1 times the mass of oxygen 15.9994 and then we can add all that up to find out that the mass of one H2O molecule is 18.01 atomic mass units and again because it's one molecule at a time it's atomic mass units based on what we've just talked about uh, in terms of our um, in terms of our elements, we can do the exact same things with our uh, molecules, and we can get a molar mass of the molecule. It's the same exact number, so the molar mass of our H2O molecule would be 18.01, but instead of being atomic mass units, it's now going to be in how many grams there are for every one mole of water molecules. So we'll say one mole of H2O. So we've now created a new unit this grams per mole in terms of our concept of molar masses. So just like before, uh, we can do the same kind of table that we made with our elements. Uh, we can make a table here and we can use the example we just had, H2O compound. Its molecular weight we already added up to be 18.01 atomic mass units and its molar mass now we can say is 18.01 grams per every one mole. We can take another compound, uh, such as this guy here, calcium carbonate, something a little bit more complex. We can calculate its weight of one molecule by taking the mass of calcium, which is approximately 40 grams, adding that to the mass of carbon, which is 12.011, and adding that to three times the mass of oxygen, which is 15.9994. Add all that stuff together and you get an answer of somewhere in the vicinity of 100.01 atomic mass units, which means it is also 100.01 grams for every one mole. I think we get the idea. When you want to have the mass of an individual element, we simply look it up on the periodic table. When you want to have the mass of a compound, we add the and constituent weights up of the individual elements to get the total mass. And then all of those things can be expressed in the terms of molar masses simply by replacing the unit atomic mass units with the units grams per mole. So then taking all of the information we've done and kind of folding it into some of the science we're going to be dealing with, uh, these mole conversions then uh, basically require dimensional analysis to move back and forth between moles and the units we're already familiar with. The good news is, is dimensional analysis works exactly the same way that it has in this all year long. It's the same exact math. We've just identified a couple new conversion factors. So let's talk about what those are. We first of all can convert now between moles and a number of atoms molecules by using the number 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. There are 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd hydrogen atoms, for example, for every one 
mole of hydrogen atoms that we deal with. And this can now convert between moles of, hydrogens, moles of hydrogen atoms and individual atoms themselves. We can likewise convert between a mole of a substance and the molar mass of the actual compound itself. Uh, as from our previous examples, we can say that for every one mole of calcium carbonate, there is 100.01 grams. So if we have a sample of calcium carbonate that we weigh in a balance, we can now convert it from the grams that the balance reads into the number of moles that we actually have. And last but not least, we can use moles now to convert between uh, moles and a volume of gas. Now this one's definitely not obvious, uh, but there's other science and work that's been done that shows that for every one mole of gas that we have, there's going to take up approximately 22.4 liters of volume. Now this is tricky because this is only true under certain conditions. We talked earlier in the year about the fact that the volume of gas varies uh, with different conditions. So under standard lab conditions, and this, by the way, STP stands for standard temperature and pressure. When we're under standard temperature and pressure, the volume of gas is 22.4. Just so we know, standard pressure is equal to one atmosphere of pressure, which is the pressure we're feeling about now. Standard temperature is zero degrees Celsius. And these are considered standard lab conditions. Any other temperature and pressure, and we have a whole nother uh, array of mathematical operations that we would do to calculate these volumes. But for now, standard temperature and pressure is the one we're going to work with. So to pull all this together, uh, what I provided for you here is a flow chart. Uh, I recommend taking a moment right now, stopping the video down at the bottom of this web page. There is a, uh, a link to this flow chart. If you want to include this electronically in notes or print it out and include it as well, I think that's a quick solution. If you'd prefer just to copy it down as is, obviously you can do that as well. Um, we're familiar now with the conversions at the bottom of the page. We're going to save this conversion for a little bit later on in the year, converting using molarity. But again, here's what we got. If you want to convert between masses and moles, you need to look up the molar mass on your periodic table. If you want to convert between moles and a volume of gas, you're going to use the standard volume, uh, which is 22.4 liters. And if you want to convert between moles and a number of particles, you're going to use Avogadro's number. This table even goes further to show you how you'll set up those conversions in the actual problem itself. To go from particles to moles, it's one mole over particles. To go from moles to particles, it's particles over one mole. Um, so this is a tool that we can use then as a way of just getting some experience and practice, um, or just kind of organizing, I suppose, the ideas that go along with these mole conversions. So let's wrap this video up with a couple example problems. Uh, for the three of these down below, I want you to convert each of them into the unit of moles. Uh, we have 3.45 times 10 to the 22nd silver atoms, 23.55 grams of silver, and 32.67 liters of chlorine gas at standard temperature and pressure. Use the flow chart from the previous page, use the conversion factors we've identified along with some dimensional analysis, and see if you can't convert these all into moles. So really quickly, uh, here's the answers for the three conversion steps that we needed to do uh, in terms of including some work here. Converting from uh, numbers of atoms into moles requires using Avogadro's number. Uh, if you recall, that means there are 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd atoms for every one mole, and that converts us from atoms to moles with atoms canceling out with atoms. To go from grams to moles, we need to look up the molar mass of silver on the periodic table. Uh, turns out that is about 107 grams for every one mole of silver atoms. We look up, there's the mass. Grams again, cancel with grams, and we get moles of silver. And then last but not least, this guy's actually nice and easy. Turns out there are 22.4 liters uh, for every one mole of gas at standard temperature and pressure. And again, liters cancel with liters to get us this value in numbers of moles. All four of these work, or all three of these I should say, work just like any other dimensional analysis problem does in the sense that we line up units diagonal for one another to cancel them out. It's just that we're using three new conversion factors. So that's pretty much it. Um, just as kind of a rundown of what it is you guys should be able to do. Uh, you should be able to describe what a mole actually is. What is it and what do we use it for? 
You should then be able to use that value to convert between the following units with dimensional analysis, between moles and mass, between moles and a number of particles, and between moles and a volume of gas at standard temperature and pressure. There was one more conversion factor down here involving concentration that we have not yet addressed. We'll definitely address that before the end of the chapter, um, but for now let's put that on the back burner and um, tackle it after we've had a conversation about concentration. As always, please make sure you bring questions to class and we will certainly be doing a bunch of practice problems until all of us feel like we're comfortable with how this mathematics works.